sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. How many of you have had a chance to read the book, uh, the first chapter of the book? Uh, I know we got it out to you probably pretty late, so it's okay if you haven't, uh, but if you have, uh, kind of give me a show of hands here. And uh, um, so I think some of the goals here, in, uh, as we move along in this is we want you to be able to identify your mental picture of God, understand that your mental picture of God shapes your faith and values. Uh, we want to be able to realize how distorted Christians view of Christmas has become. We want you to hear the message of Christmas is about a sacrificial gift understand that Christmas is the celebration of a miracle and realize that God's miracles are conceived and delivered through ordinary people who are willing to act on God's vision. Okay, we have a group activity here. And um, so what I would like for you to do tonight, and I'll write them down, is uh, if you have a, if you know a name for Jesus, go ahead and uh, speak that out loud, and I'll write it down. Christus. Pardon me? Christus. Okay. Boni. Say that again. I, I hope I'm not making this up. <laughs> Rabboni. Oh, yeah. Okay. Emmanuel. Anything else? Prince of Peace. All right. Prince of Peace. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Okay. Counselor. Wonderful counselor. Counselor. Savior. Savior. Teacher. Teacher. Okay. We have in uh, the chat here, Lord of Lords and Light of the World. All right. Ah, the word. John chapter wor John chapter one. The light. The word was in the beginning was the word. The word uh, was with God. And the word was God. Uh, that's one. That's probably my favorite scripture. Uh, okay, so here is a homework assignment for you. If you can, with these names in mind, get a piece of paper and a pencil or a crayon or whatever you have and draw a picture of what you believe that Jesus looks like. I think that that will uh, help you draw a mental picture of what you believe Jesus looks like. And uh, next week, we're going to share those uh, on the video with each other. I think you look better than anything I can draw. What's that? I think he looks better than anything I can draw. <laughs> well, you just never know. You don't want to es underestimate God's creative power uh, in you. You know, the scripture, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay, so that's one of the things we want to do is try to get a mental picture of what Jesus looks like.
I think we're ready for the video presentation. Megan, yeah, you're ready. This is about 13 minutes long, just so everyone kind of knows what to expect. Hello, I want to welcome you to this first session, Expect a Miracle. What does God look like? How would you recognize God if or when God showed up? Before Jesus was born, expectation of what this Messiah would look like and be like were really quite diverse and even contradictory. Some expected a worldly political revolutionary who would restore the past glory days of the Davidic kingdom, while other people visualized a Messiah who represented a Greek ideal focused totally only on the afterlife. Let's face it. You know, Jesus wasn't what most folks expected. When you think about God, adjectives like powerful and majestic, almighty, you know, those kind of things tend to come to mind. But Jesus was born a Palestinian Jew into a community of marginalized, oppressed people. He spent the first years of his life as a refugee in Africa, eluding political genocide. His formative years were spent in a nondescript village as a member of an ordinary working class family. And as a man, Jesus lived in tension with the organized religious system. He resisted the world's obsessions with wealth, pleasure, power, and he identified with the weak and powerless, the widow, the orphan. He doesn't condemn but defends the sinner. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus, we see not only the face of God, but in the fullness of his humanity, we see who you and I are created to be. You know, I can believe in a God who looks like Jesus. Too often this time of year, we kind of confuse God with Santa Claus, a, a God who's a genie in a bottle who's here to fulfill three wishes. All you have to do is name it and claim it, believe it and receive it. Well, this Santa Claus Jesus of our imagination is, is really an idol of consumption who supports the human quest for meaning and purpose in material things outside of a relationship with God. The picture that you have of God has everything to do with the shaping of your faith and values. If your picture of God is distorted, your life perspective is going to be skewed. So it's, it's really no wonder our experience and expectations of the Christmas season become skewed by this faulty image of Jesus as a magical gift giver. You know, God doesn't do magic. Magic's an illusion. It's not real. It's for entertainment purposes only. It's not about transformation. God came to earth to work miracles in our broken world. The ideal we imagine of this magical Christmas experience is unattainable. We stress ourselves out. We go into debt to create that warm, fuzzy feeling for our families and ourselves. But we all know that feeling doesn't last. The real meaning of a Christmas gets lost in the chaotic clutter of shopping and spending and escalating debt and exhausting preparations. The stacks of gifts that most of us don't need or, or, or many we, we may never use. You know, I, I still find shirts in my closet that I've never worn given to me who knows how many Christmases ago. Yeah, in, the, in this chaos of the holiday season, we, we miss the true gift, Emmanuel, God with us. Christmas has been hijacked and exploited by consumer culture. Christmas is the celebration of a miracle. But we've edged the miracle worker out of his own birthday celebration. Hey, it is time to take it back by planning new traditions that focus on the presence of the real Jesus rather than the often forgettable presence that we expect to receive. So, so how do we prepare for God's miracle? Well, the dictionary defines a miracle as a visible interruption of the laws of nature, understood only by divine intervention and often accompanied by a miracle worker. In other words, a miracle is when God wants to do something unique in the world, and he does it through people like you and me. That's right. You are God's miracle worker. 
You are God's means to affect change in your world. God wants to birth a miracle through you. But you don't feel qualified, you say? You, you lack the necessary knowledge? You have doubts and uncertainties? Hey, don't sweat it. God births miracles through ordinary people. All God needs is your availability and commitment to act. I mean, look at Jesus. The prophet Isaiah, and, and I want to read this from the book, chapter 53, a, a description of what the Messiah will look like. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Like, does this sound like the profile of a world movement leader? Throughout Scripture, God chooses ordinary, unqualified people through whom to do miracles. You have ineloquent Moses, the youngest child David, Baron Elizabeth, and, and of course Mary, Jesus' mother. Luke records the words from what's become known as Mary's song. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. The Greek word for humble means low in situation, poor and depressed. Jesus said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses. The kind of power that Jesus is talking about is not a power of position, or wealth or prestige. The power of Emmanuel is the power to create change in the world through God's action through your life. The, the world's looking for the elaborate, the expensive, the extraordinary, and that's why most people miss Jesus. We're looking for the extraordinary when the, when the majority of us are just very ordinary. And that's the good news. God uses ordinary people. We only have to be willing to be used. We'll so let me ask you this question. We'll Are you willing to pay the price? I want to think about that for a minute. Because miracles come with a sacrificial cost. Grace may be free, but it's never cheap. Can, can you imagine the ostracism that Mary experienced as an unwed teenager? It, it was definitely not the miracle that she is hoping for. Is this what it means to receive God's favor? Or, or what about Joseph? Do you think he ever had doubts about the origins of Mary's pregnancy? <laughs> I'm sure he did. You know, at Christmas, we celebrate the birth of, of the Messiah deliverer who was born to show us how to live sacrificially and, and to die sacrificially for us. And sacrifice isn't a pleasant word for most of us. I mean, sacrifice makes me uncomfortable. When all is said and done, most folks would rather have a happy, holly jolly holiday experience rather than be a living womb for an honest to God Christmas miracle. It, it doesn't help that many of the current Christmas traditions that we hold to as, as Christian are really just a mix of a little biblical truth blended with Victorian practices of the 18th century along with a double shot of Santa Claus theology. The message of Christmas is really about making our lives meaningful. And for our lives to be meaningful, we have to give them away. A meaningful Christmas is not found in mindless spending, eating, and stress. When we give sacrificially to those in need, we're giving to Jesus himself. And folks, after all, it's really Jesus' birthday. Every miracle of God is conceived in the heart of a believer. It grows in conviction and clarity, and then it's delivered through a committed action. As the angel Gabriel said to Mary, you will conceive and give birth. You must have a clear picture in your mind of what God wants to accomplish through you before the miracle can become a physical reality. God plants the seeds of miracles in the hearts of available people who are willing to act on God's vision. Gateway Community is a worshiping fellowship made up of people who receive food from one of the Gamsburg New Path food pantries that serve people throughout the greater Dayton, Ohio area. 
the people come together every Monday evening for a meal served by different cell groups from the church. The participants worship together and are invited to an open table for communion. The seed for the vision of this miracle was planted in the heart of Therese Garrison. This is her story in her words. My name is Therese Garrison. I'm an educational aide at Helke Elementary in Vandalia. Our cell group used to feed the homeless at a food kitchen downtown and it closed a year ago, May, and we were all very passionate about it and had been praying as to what to do next. And I said, Lord, what is it you want us to do? You know, give us some direction. And I just clearly heard him say, why aren't you feeding the people at New Path? They're hungry too. Sent out an email to Sherry Camfarelli and just kind of said, this is what I heard and is this even a possibility? You know, she thought it was a good idea and it has just grown from that point on. It's turned into a meal with a message and communion and just um, such a great environment. Um, I see the presence of God there every week. I had a lady I was interviewing for uh, the food pantry and she said, my son who's seven years old begs me to take him to church. She said, we consider this our church. Each week I'm blessed by more and more servants that come in and offer a new idea that's, you know, going to work. Right from the beginning, a lady thought, well, we should serve them coffee. I thought, that's great. You know, she took that over. Another person made out of knives, spoons and forks, a little stand to put our numbers in on the table. So it's made a cross. Another lady said, you know, we shouldn't just have desserts out. We should just start serving them to them so they feel special. We often call it the Chaos Cafe, but it's uh, all good chaos. It all works out in the end. Um, I know God can use anybody that's got a willing, open heart. It doesn't have to be, you know, a leader in the church. It could be any one of us. Um, God's using me, and if He can use me, He can use anybody. Therese was God's agent to carry the message of mission to her cell group. The vision grew in conviction and clarity in her group and then the group gave birth to God's miracle. There wasn't any formal institutional church process that needed the approval of committees or administrative boards. Every spirit-filled Christian has the potential for a God movement within themselves. The miracle of God is conceived and delivered through ordinary people who are willing to dream God's dreams and then act on God's vision. I wanna ask you a question. Are you ready for God to birth a Christmas miracle through you? Okay, I think we're back. Mike Slaughter points out that Jesus was not what most people expected. He didn't possess worldly wealth or majestic power. In fact, he resisted the world's obsessions with wealth, pleasure, power, and recognition. In spite of this, we have allowed materialism and consumerism to skew our view of Jesus. We've created a Santa Claus Jesus who promises to fulfill all our earthly wants and wishes. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question here that I'd like for you to uh, discuss. Uh, how have Christmas celebrations in your life changed throughout the years since you were children? How have Christmas celebrations changed in your life since you were children? Well, for me, uh, 
we no longer have the young people act out the birth of Jesus, the manger scene. And that every year that just seemed to be a special part of Christmas to me. Mm -hmm. And it's just missing. Okay. So you think that the church Christmas programs have are lacking? Yes. But how about your own Christmas celebration at your house? How's that changed? Everyone's grown up and they do their own thing. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it seems like, um, well, when when I was a kid, of course, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of money. There was a so, time like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. Before they made the wheel, uh, there there wasn't a lot of presents. Mostly, it was clothes, and we were very appreciative to have the clothes because. Uh, that way we could go to school and look pretty decent and not have raggedy old work clothes. Um, it seems like the children receive more gifts now. I mean... Uh, and aren't uh, appreciative. Well, yeah, and aren't appreciative. But, but you know, as far as adults go, uh, as I remember, there was never a lot of, of that because mom and dad didn't waste money on... They didn't have it to waste on each other. On they, they'd stuff. get the kids something. And, and but I'm the same way. I mean, uh, I, I when there were kids in the house, we we uh, we overdid them, but we didn't get ourselves anything. And, and that was about giving to them. And maybe it was overdone. I'm sure it was. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think for us, I mean, we um, we always went out and we cut a real Christmas tree, an old cedar tree. My parents had a farm south of Mount Air, Iowa, and and uh, we'd go out there and cut it. Well, Dad got the idea that he was going to plant a bunch of Christmas trees for uh, uh, you know for resale. <laughs> Well, they, they got big enough and they were beautiful enough that he couldn't bring himself to cut them down and sell them. So we had like 1,500 scotch pines and, and blue spruce <laughs> on this old hill farm south of uh, Mount Air. And, uh, <laughs> and so we always had a real Christmas tree. And I remember decorating the tree back then and you know, and, and Becky is listening to this and she's wondering, now what has happened to you, Mr. Bumbug, through the years? You don't like to decorate the Christmas tree. Now, we used to you know, do the thing where we cut out uh, construction paper and we glued the loops together and then sewed popcorn together and always put a, an angel on top of the tree. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, we had nice presents, but, you know, the underneath the tree, it wasn't jam packed full of presents, but yet we never felt deprived of anything. And, um, you know, for us, Christmas was more about a time of getting together with family than, and I guess really for us, it's still probably is in our family gatherings. So if Jesus was a guest at your family's Christmas celebration, what would he observe? Hmm. If Jesus showed up at your family Christmas celebration, what would he observe? Well, he wouldn't be hungry. That's for sure. He'd be well fed. <laughs> He'd be watching all of us become well fed. He, he might. <laughs> he would most likely hear music at ours. Oh, yeah. 
you'd probably be wondering why we didn't gather somebody off the street to come in. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus. <laughs> That's an excuse, Carol. <laughs> like Bob said today, did Jesus turn away from the lepers? Nope. Mm -hmm. I didn't use that on the people he was expecting me to. But oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just thought again, <clears throat> another thing that has changed but hasn't changed. When I was a kid, uh, I became a drug kid at Christmas Eve. Mom dragged, dragged me to church every Christmas Eve. And, you know, I miss that now. And I'll miss that we won't be able to be in the church. But that's become very important to me. So that in itself has not changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, Kathy deal here is is on the the zoom cast here tonight from greenbrier church and i count greenbrier as my home church and it's a little country church five miles north of uh, bagley iowa and we always went to uh, the christmas eve service there at, at greenbrier and my brother Mike, one year, I think, I can't remember, I must have been a freshman or a sophomore. And my brother Mike, that most of you know him, he lives here in Winterset, and another kid by the name of David Bebb, we had to all three get together and sing We Three Kings of Orient Are. <laughs> and so I'll never forget, we were standing there with our Ham's going, we're three kings. Of <laughs> <laughs> and then our Sunday school teacher was in the back of the room. His name was Gene Blanchin. And he was trying and he was trying to keep from just blurting out laughing. And uh, so when I think of Christmas Eve services, I that's my I go back to that experience. <laughs> anyway. I guess that was perfect. Can they hear me? I think so. Uh, yeah. I remember um, always going to uh, Christmas Eve services in our town in Hancock. And then we'd all go over to my aunt and uncle's house. But around midnight, we would traipse back to the church with my uncle and ring the church bell. We did uh -huh. that for many, many years. That was so much fun. Yeah. Well, I remember a couple things. So <clears throat> it was always a big deal at the country school. We always had a program at night, and he invited all the neighbors, and grandparents, and everybody would come. And Santa would be there with a, a sack of candy. The same thing was true at church. He always got a sack of candy, and at that time, there was usually an orange in there. And during the Second World War, that was really something to get an orange because uh, those yeah. things were not available. Very right. big treat, yes. Yeah, that was uh, pretty outstanding. As far as gifts, uh, each each of us would get one gift. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we were happy to get that. Oh, it's yeah. a lot different than today, where you know it is. Our yeah. kids have so many gifts; they they don't know what to do with them sometimes. I, I remember in 1968, I was 10 years old, and my mom was the superintendent of the Methodist Church in Missouri Valley, and at Christmas, there was this, this movement or this program called Keep Christ in Christmas, and maybe you remember that. It probably comes up, you know, over and over, but even back then in the good old days, uh, I think we saw that it was getting too commercial and we needed to recenter ourselves on what it was all about. So some things never change, I guess. Yeah. This is true. Yep. Very good. 
Okay, so what are some of the things that you currently enjoy or love about the holiday season? And, and what don't you like? I've always enjoyed the Christmas program at the church. Mm -hmm. uh, Amen. Meredith did a wonderful job of doing that for many years. And it was really nice and meaningful. Yeah. I miss the choir. I miss the choir practices. love the spirit that people have, which sounds kind of like a cliche, but I think it's real and we feel it when we see it. And nothing feels better than when we extend it. You know, um, even just something as simple as complimenting people who maybe don't normally get many compliments. I just think we're a lot more inclined to behave that way and, and feel that way when it's Christmas season. Well, this year for what all we've been through and all the noise that we've had to listen to, that is most especially appropriate for, for now. We need that more than ever now, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I decided today I need to find a child that I could give a pony to at Christmas because <laughs> my favorite memory is when my granddad deal, we always went to the Greenbrier church service that Mark's mentioning. Uh, and I was horse crazy from the time I, I don't even know, one or two years old or whatever. And when I was four, I just, I knew I was going to get a pony. I didn't know it, but I, I believed it, you know? And uh, my granddad, Deal, brought a pony with ribbons in her mane and tail to the steps. And my sister and I went out there in our footed pajamas and <laughs> got on this pony. And it was just pure, pure magic. And the time with my grandfather on learning to ride and, and everything, and I missed that. And uh, the first thing I thought, I have no children. And so I don't have anybody to do that with. And if, I mean, that's not, that's not um, something I should say because there are children everywhere that probably could use a pony <laughs> or somebody to <laughs> help them with a pony. And um, somebody was showing me their little child and I said, oh my gosh, we need to get her a pony. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, no, that's magical. Needs a pony. <laughs> so I, I would love to do that. And there's no reason you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but there's no reason we can't reach out. And I have a virtual family member, which sounds kind of crazy, or I'm the virtual family member to this family in uh, Florida. And I'm kind of like hang on their phone a lot, you know, <laughs> now that we're all virtual. <laughs> and the little boy was not doing his school. Any of you have kids that are like doing virtual school, but you know, it's tough to get them to do it. So I started giving, talking to him, you know, here I am in Iowa, he's in Florida, but it's through the, you know, AirPods on our ears etc and I, I talked to him about you know what did he need to do and I said you know what I'm gonna give you a challenge I said you get 95 or more on the next five reading papers and I am sending you a prize now I'm not saying that to say how great I am not at all I'm just saying it gave me such joy I, I was amazed at myself how much fun I had with that and then I thought I ought to just find some other kids that aren't living up to their potential. And, you know, I mean, it just was fun. It was fun. So anyway, I didn't send him a pony though. I thought yeah, that's yeah. where that was leading. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know that would have been good, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, how many stamps would that take? <laughs> you could send a picture. Yeah. Very good point. That's a good point, yeah. We get COVID over with, and I think they're just going to be, if we can hang on to the spirit of missing people and wanting to do things like that, there will be opportunities everywhere yeah. when we get through this time. Well, that's Thank you for sharing about Greenbrier. 
Mark, you know, that church was built in 1895. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thank and you. I think uh, I was able to be there for their hundredth anniversary. I think they had it in 1994 because they were afraid it might close uh, <laughs> the next year before their hundredth anniversary, but they're still going, but uh, wow. I hear that could be a little tenuous. It is, unfortunately. Um, what are having their ice cream socials, Kathy? Oh, yes, thank you. I love the ice cream socials and the pie. <laughs> oh, I loved going to those. Yes. All right. Kathy, do you know Bev? You know. She, she was Bev Whitney from Bagley. Oh my gosh, of course you are. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. I kind you of, also, your face looks familiar. Oh my gosh, thank you. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm kind of monopolizing. But no, that's, that's okay. Good. That's great. I can't see anybody anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you can't go anywhere that you don't meet somebody you know. <laughs> no, are you? Why don't I see anybody? Okay, so. Um, Did you hit Carol? Yes, what? You did something to shut your video off, apparently. Well, when I put it, it says rename and raise hand. Rename and resend. Raise hand. Raise hand. Oh, raise hand. I don't know. Yeah, there's raise hand. Lower hand. Yeah, it has a video with it red and a line through it. Mm. Oh, you, you've turned your video off. So uh, it did it itself. <laughs> well. Oh, well, well, but you can still hear us, can't you, Carol? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, Slaughter points out that the real meaning of Christmas is the celebration of a miracle, the birth of the Messiah. Jesus' mother, Mary, was an ordinary girl chosen to grow and deliver God's precious miracle. Today, God still works miracles through ordinary people. God plants the seeds of miracles in the hearts of available people who are willing to act on God's vision. How, imagine how Mary felt after speaking with the angel. You think she felt qualified for such an awesome responsibility? No. What did, she, what did she do to prepare for delivering God's miracle? So why do you think God chooses to deliver miracles through ordinary people? And how can we uh, prepare to deliver the miracle that God is growing in our heart? So let's go back to that first one. Why do you think God chooses to deliver miracles through ordinary people? He's a I big fool of us. Fun. Sorry. There's a big pool of us ordinary people. There is. I think it's also more inspiring if it's someone that we view as ordinary than someone that maybe we view uh, in a different light, but yet really we're all ordinary, but in that vein, I think it inspires us more. Yeah, what Kathy says, it makes it more, or Kathleen, she said, it makes it more relatable also. Mm -hmm. You know, if a superstar is doing something extraordinary, you're like, oh, that's un completely unobtainable. I'll never be a superstar. But if it's somebody ordinary like yourself, it makes it more relatable as well. You know, I think the spirit of God is at work in all, in all of this that when we say yes to Jesus, that we will follow you, Jesus, you, we make you the Lord of our life, that uh, the Holy Spirit comes alive within us and through us and empowers us, and he speaks to us. And, and think about a sonar ping. God speaks to us when he, when God wants a, 
I think God wants to birth a miracle in each and every one of us uh, that want to follow him. And, and when we follow him, I'm not exactly saying this very good. If we're really listening to him, he pings our heart and, and he quickens something within us. And that's, to me, that's kind of the, the seed being planted and, and being birthed within us. Mike Slaughter says it here, uh, are you willing to be a living womb for an honest to God miracle? Are you willing to be a living womb for an honest to God miracle? Are you willing to open yourself up to the spirit of the living God? Are you open to, uh, to, to a living Jesus that wants to have um, action in your life to do something uh, even small can be great. I think that's why he picks on ordinary people. There's an old saying that says, uh, uh, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So how can we prepare to deliver the miracle that God is growing in our hearts? I'll give you a hint. Starts with a P. Prayer. Ah, there you go. Uh, we just pray and leave ourselves open. And sometimes, folks, praying isn't doing all the talking. Praying is just being quiet before God and letting him speak to you, just like I talked about letting him pain you. I just wish sometimes he wouldn't pick two o'clock in the morning. I'll be quiet sooner. Well, that would work. <laughs> I have to tell you, some of my sermons come to me at 4 a.m. Oh, yeah. <laughs> On Saturday night. <laughs> well. Or Sunday morning, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just really? You had to wait this long? Yeah. Well, Just I've had it. happened. I was going to go one way and then Saturday night or early Sunday morning. God speaks to you and pings you and leads oh, you in a different direction. And then sometimes God pings me and leads me in a different direction between Patterson and Witterset <laughs> on Sunday morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had to deliver a, a short 10-minute a sermon in one of my classes. And uh, it was like about five seconds before I started that I got to ping. So that was an interesting one. It was it was actually quite good because I threw the notes away and, and just stood up there and, and spoke from the heart. And it was a good one. Have you ever witnessed or experienced a miracle? If so, what happened? I saw my daughter's born. That was a miracle. <clears throat> that is. May 17th, I was with my mother. She was very ill with COVID and they thought she was dying. And she appeared to be. And I, I told her, you know, mom, if, if this is your time, you go, we're fine. You're the best mother in the world. We will carry on. We girls are tight and all this. But if you want to come back, you come back. She started coming up, 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 her countenance, not physically, but her, her whole spirit. 
and she was very weak and not, you know, real conscious yet. And she said, I saw Jesus. He had his arms open. Oh, boy. And then as she started coming up a little more, her, you know, color, et cetera, I said, Mother, would you like a cup of coffee? She was a coffee drinker. And she said, I would love a cup of coffee. So my sister and I put our heads out the door and said to the nurses helpers out there, mother would like a cup of coffee. Is that possible? And they're like, you know, what? She's asking for coffee. <laughs> yes, she is. We're coffee girls. So in they came with the coffee and mother got better, better. And um, she told us that she said, Jesus told me he wasn't ready for me yet. Now that was a miracle to me. It was a miracle because my mother was not the kind of person to talk like that. Mm -hmm. In the law, we would call that an excited utterance. That when someone is dying or severely injured, there's the court gives great truthfulness to what they say because you're not going to lie or make stuff up. Well, I was not like my mother to talk that way. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. She saw Jesus and then he said he wasn't ready for her. And she had two more experiences over the course of seven days that were similar. Not exactly, but saw a big white house with many rooms. And I share this with you, even though it's real personal, because to me, that was a miracle. It's the miracle that's kept me going, that she had that experience. And of course, the staff there started calling her like she had nine lives, you know. <laughs> and, um, but that was a miracle I think God sent me to help me get through this of her dying and not being here because she was my we lived together she was my runaround pal she was you know all of that and um i think it was a miracle as much sent to me so that i can be comforted that it was a if you will a positive experience for my mother Amen. does that sound kind of odd i know i'm being real personal i don't even know y'all <laughs> but you know sometimes <laughs> grief kind of makes you but it just, to me, that's one of the biggest miracles of my life is what I experienced there with my mom. Very good. Yeah. That's a, that's a wonderful story. And, of course, and I knew your mother very well. And um, so praise God for that story. Of, yeah. You know, and that just reinforces what my wife Becky has always said. There is wonder working power in coffee, there's Jesus in coffee. <laughs> yes, I agree with that. <laughs> we are, we are big coffee drinkers also. Yeah. But we've had a similar experience with Becky's brother a number of years ago. Uh, he was in, at Mercy Hospital and he had some autoimmune reaction. And the doctor came out and said, I don't think he's going to make it. And Becky and her sister and uh, myself and uh, I think maybe a couple, uh, some of our kids were with us. We gathered around that hospital bed. We anointed him with oil and we prayed the prayer of faith over him and he started to come out of it and he's still going today. Oh, so uh, what a miracle. Yeah, that was plain and simply a miracle. And, uh, you know, so I believe in the power of prayer and, and I believe in miracles today. Do you think God could actually work a miracle through your life? I think he does and has. We just haven't recognized it. That's the whole thing. Sometimes we do things and we don't realize that we're being led and taught. We're just not listening close enough.
Yeah, you know, sometimes we, we think of miracles as being grandiose, and sometimes they're more on the, I don't know, just something extraordinary. Like our Thanksgiving dinner that we're giving away, 300 reservations. To me, that is a, a miracle here in Winterset in the middle of a pandemic that we're going to be able to serve 300 people. Don't say social media doesn't work. <laughs> well, the power of God works through many cool. different channels. So. Yes. He led those people to read that post that was there. Yep. So they knew there was some place for them to go Thanksgiving to get a meal. Well, folks, it's 930. So I, I want to keep this to an hour, 929. Uh, and we have a participant handout that I'd like to email to all of you. And uh, so it'll probably come out tomorrow. And it's got the key insights and some take home uh, points here. And so, uh, Kathy, do you have an email I could send this to? Yes, would you like me to put it on the chat or to yeah. send it to you on a message? Chat? Just, just send it on the chat. <laughs> and uh, we'll get this all out to you hopefully tomorrow. And um, so with that, um, I have one other little activity I'd like for you to do. And then I would like for you to look up Away in the Manger, that hint, Christmas Carol. And um, I would like for you to read that and see if you believe that through some of these Christmas carols, we have somewhat we believe to be beautiful and we've grown up with and we love, that it somewhat sanitizes the, the Christmas message. And I think what they're trying to get to here is, uh, you know, the cattle are lowing. You have this image of what it's like in the, in the stable in Bethlehem and the little Lord Jesus, no crying he made. I'm guessing it didn't really happen that way. So, uh, but who knows? Okay, so with that, I would like to close this out in prayer. Lord God, we celebrate you and the birth of your precious son, Jesus. This time of learning and sharing has made us so aware of God with us. We're grateful for your word and the opportunity to study about the miracles that you perform. As we continue our study in the weeks ahead, prepare our hearts to conceive and deliver your miracles and our feet to act on your vision. Amen. Well, thank you folks for attending here tonight. I hope you've gotten something out of it. Um, I just enjoy doing this. Hopefully next week we might be a little better prepared. Uh, but uh, all in all, I think it went very well. And uh, thank you all for joining. Very much. Enjoyed it. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor Mark. Yep. Thank yeah, you, guys. Pastor Mark. Yeah. Pastor Mark.